So today we're going to talk about your software supply chain, the threats to your software supply chain, and S bonds as the response to secure your supply chain, or, or at least a key component in that. And then we're just going to practically talk about how to generate it, to host it, to analyze it, and how to make it actionable. And we'll have a few like a workflow and a demo. So I actually have a video because I was too scared to do a live demo. But uh, you can pretend it's a real console. So and um, I hope at the end of this you learn about S bonds. Uh, you figure out that they're really important. To, uh, it's really important to know what is in your software and that you can use this to drive vulnerability management. So here's an image from the SASA website. It's um, a framework for software, uh, building and secure software. Um, so here's, it shows your software supply chain. So your software supply chain are all the elements that go into building your software. All your tools, your CI CD, your, your package manager, your R flash repository, your source code, and a huge part of it is your dependencies, which can be in house, but they're really likely to be open source dependencies. So, oh, that image is like I went to the open source summit in Dublin. I think I saw five talks that had the same image, so I'm pretty basic, but what can you do? Uh, so open source software is like, wherever there's software, there's open source. I keep on seeing that number go up and up, where like 90% of software contains open source, and, it, and it's a huge amount of that software. It's really positive, like Kubernetes, Debian, Nginx. Um, innovation will be painfully slow without open source software. I don't want to do Kubernetes again. I don't think he wants to, wants to do that. So, um, but it's not more, it's not less secure than in case software, but it's just a, a great move for attackers to attack multiple, um, multiple systems using the same vulnerability. And if you want to secure your software, you have to secure your open source. So the main threats in open source software is um, attackers can target how you consume that software through public repositories like uh, Maven, Central, PyPI, NPM, by hosting maybe malware and tricking you into installing it using hyper squatting, which is like waiting for you to make a mistake when you're writing your requirements file, or dependency confusion, which is kind of using the mechanism for um, consuming software where like they figure out what's in your private repo, the names of the packages, push it up to a public repo and hope that somehow it's brought into your code base. But the main source of the uh, threats is probably critical vulnerabilities in open source. So something like log4shell in the log4j package. Or in Heartbeat as well, that was a bad one. So let's talk about the critical vulnerabilities a little bit more. Um, there was a research report by the Incident Responders from Palo Alto published in July, which showed that um, the, the initial attack vector for, they looked at over 600 incidents, and the initial attack vector for uh, over 30% of cases was critical vulnerabilities in software, but second only to phishing. And log for shell was like a really popular, it was the most popular open source critical vulnerability to use as an initial attack vector. And then this was published in July and that was only out since December. So that was a bad one. So, um, and another report from 2020 showed that Heartbeat was still being used as a, um, was still being scanned for, for uh, to, to hack into systems. In 2020, even though it was patched in 2014. So critical vulnerabilities have a really long tail, and any vulnerabilities in open source software, especially bad ones, will have an effect for years and years. So log for shell will probably still be an issue in like five years time, <laughs> or maybe more. And the reason for that is that sometimes it's um, patching isn't a priority for organizations. Uh, sometimes you're using abandoned open source software that's not been updated. Or a lot of the times you don't even know what you're using. So like a, 
dependency of a dependency of a dependency, but it still can be used as an attack vector. At the end of 2020, I think, um, that really highlighted software supply chain attacks. Um, basically, they had a product, some networking product, and a state actor got in to their build pipeline, and it, it, this software was uh, used by government agencies, critical infrastructure, loads of big organizations, and it was a it was a huge threat to, and it kind of brought the, the issue up to like government level. And the response to that was, I thought it was pretty aggressive by, by the US government. They published, they signed this executive order on cybersecurity last year, and in it they described that whoever wrote it like really understood how software was written, they understood that open source is really important. And instead of saying, we need to pull out all the open source and not use open source anymore, they said, no, we need to know what's in our software, and then you can secure it. And one of their mechanisms that they um, highlighted for doing this was S bonds, so software building materials. And they mandated that software um, sold to federal agencies will have to include an S bond. And that's coming in about now. I think there's something in the Senate about it. Um, as well as that, after Log4Shell, the, the um, critical vulnerability in Log4J, the White House brought in, so this is like in January, they brought in um, representatives, representatives from open source, from um, the Linux Foundation, OpenSSF, and uh, big tech companies that consume a lot of open source software, from critical infrastructure as well. And they brought them all in to all the stakeholders in, and they came up with this plan. And they have a lot of money behind it, 150 million. And um, they, they were like this 10 point mobilization plan, which big tech companies are paying for, not the US government. But that, and part of it, one of the steps was S bonds everywhere, uh, funding and initiatives to, try, to drive adoption, improve tooling, and training around um, using S bonds. And two weeks ago, the European Union published their first draft for. Uh, their Cyber Resilience Act. So it'll be a few years before this actually comes into, into effect. But in it, they mention S bonds and how they inspect S bonds from suppliers to critical infrastructure. So, finally, I'm talking about S bonds like I, I, I can't explain it yet. So, the talk is like uh, the new standard in uh, software build materials and but it's actually not a new standard, I lied to you all. It's been around for ages. So, and even the concept has been around for years, in like decades in, in manufacturing and food production. You see, you get your box of cornflakes, you see the ingredient mm -hmm. list at the back of it. So, S1, a software built materials, is a list of components of what is in your software the version number, the naming, and the dependencies. And um, there's standards to support this. And standards are really important because they drive automation. So there's two standards, both ISOs, SPDX and CycloneDX. They're both great. <laughs> Their um, SPDX is slightly more licensing focused. And CycloneDX, because it's under OWASP, it's more like vulnerability management, security focused. But they're both great. Um, I suppose. What S1 will do is answer the question of what is in my software. So um, now we're going to go on to like the practical stage of what you actually. Now we have a standard. How do you actually generate the S1? How do you host it? And analyze the S1 for vulnerabilities. So there's different stages of the software lifecycle that you can actually generate the S bomb. You can generate it at source. You can generate it from the builds artifact. You can generate from a uh, container image from at runtime or at build time. And there's lots of tools, lots of open source tooling, but it's still an emerging space. So these software composition analysis tools that work on source code or in built artifacts can be really useful. 
if you have legacy code and you don't actually have the source, you're not entirely sure how it connects back to the source code, you can only work on the built artifact. So those tools are great. Also the ones that work on the source code, um, the positives around working on source code is that longitudinal is um, uh, integrates nicely with CSCD. It's really early in the software lifecycle, so you can catch things earlier, that shift lefty. Um, uh, but the, and it can produce a um, SBOM, an, an accurate enough information that will be useful in your to understand your software supply chain. Some of the negatives around um, generating it at source is that it can be uh, less accurate than other stages. Uh, the reasons for that might include um, test packages that are not actually in your deployed artifact. It might um, it might not have transient dependencies, so these are dependencies of dependencies, or it might work better if um, you use package managers and code installed outside of that is uh, like kind of invisible, or it might not be able to figure out what dependency, what version of dependency you're using. Like if you say something like, um, uh, in your configuration file, you might have something like, I'll use any version greater than six. Well, if you're dependent, to be, if you're creating your S bomb out of that, it's impossible for the, uh, the generator to know the exact um, versions in the final deployed product. There's ways to improve their accuracy, like using lock files and stuff like this, but generally it's, just, it's thought to be a bit less accurate than other stages. You can also generate your S bomb. Um, on your built container images. Um, some of the tuning around it is really nice. Um, actually, a lot of the workflows around using it with container images are really nice. Um, Anchor is tuning the little owl there. It's open source. And um, uh, Trivi as well has a open source generator. And these can work. They've, they have knowledge of just the layers in your OCI container image. They know where files are. And they uh, work with package managers as well to develop this uh, to generate your SBOM. So some of the positives are that like the workflows are really nice around uh, container images. Um, it can slot into your CI CD really nicely. Um, it, it can be really accurate. Um, some of the negatives are that it can, can be a bit slow. It's a bit later on in your software lifecycle. It's the built artifact. It can also give you a lot of false positives. Maybe there's software on your container image that has nothing to do with the deployed, like it's not running on a deployed uh, image and that has implications with vulnerability management where you're trying to prioritize vulnerabilities. Um, so, and also it works better if you build, if you build stuff using a package manager because it's it knows where those those files are. Another way to build it is at build time. So this the NTIA, it's the standard agency of the US actually recommends doing that, but there's but, um, so that's great. <laughs> there's, not, there's not as much tuning around this. That's probably where the biggest fault is. And also there's an issue with false positives as well, where you might they might list the amount of um, they might list packages that are not actually relevant in the running um, running software tool. Another time to generate them is at runtime. So um, the positives around the runtime generators are that you actually uh, you actually um, get a list of uh, components that are actually running and you should prioritize these packages because they're exploitable um, because they're actually on your running system. They also have information about what services are used, like if any ports are closed, that kind of thing can be really helpful for um, security professionals trying to prioritize vulnerabilities. Uh, JBOM is an open source tool that will, that will generate a runtime one for Java, Java products. And there's a lot of proprietary tooling around, uh, around container images and generating SBOMs. And it may be not SBOMs, but like giving you information about 
what's running on your um, on your container and your deployed container and what some of the mechanisms are in it. It's very late on the stage, I mean, it's already running. So, uh, but uh, the positives are that it's really important information and really helps prioritize your vulnerabilities. So, generating your SBOM at all the different stages, they all have benefits. And it would be cool to generate them all at all the different stages and merge them all together. And that workflow is still really early, but that would be ideal. Like if you knew everything that was on your product, everything that was actually the most exploitable, that would be a really powerful um, bit of information to have. So we know how to generate them, let's host our S-bombs. So the nicest way, to, uh, the nicest ecosystem to host them in is OCI artifacts because there's um, there's tooling around kind of like people are, are uh, you can host your SBOM alongside your container image using a six door tooling and sign. You can even sign it and attach it to your image and it's hosted alongside it in your, your image in a different layer. So but hosting non-OCI artifacts is, um, is, is not really defined yet, like what's the best practice. So you can host them in a database, in like a file store, you can host them on an artifact repository. Like in CloudSmith, you might host them as a raw file format. We still have to connect that to your actual built artifact. So it's, it's not as nice a flow. Um, there's one tool, Dependency Tracker or Dermal Wasp, which will host all your your SBOMs for you and has a, a it's like the best um, open like it's the best tooling for for this problem. It can host all your SBOMs and do vulnerability ma um, management. So that could be uh, one way you can do it. But we're kind of waiting for best practices around this. Like maybe package managers might decide to include an SBOM as part of their uh, as part of their package or something like that. We're, we're still we're still waiting. So let's talk now about we talked about generating your SBOM, where to store it, and then we want to talk about what to do with it. So one of the main things that um, one of the main use cases for SBOMs is to uh, drive vulnerability management. So you might want to say, um, am I vulnerable to log for shell? That would be a, a classic question. Um, how do you do that? So before we go on, we'll talk a bit about vulnerabilities. So um, a vulnerability is a flaw in your software that an attacker can use to exploit, um, um, to can get into your system or your customer systems. So um, some of the terminology around it includes a CVE, which is common vulnerability and exposures, I think. And it's basically an ID that you can communicate about a vulnerability. So you're talking about the same thing. It doesn't have much information beyond that. The, and another thing um, that's important to vulnerabilities is the score, the severity score. So that's where CVSS comes in. It'll tell you, uh, give you a score out of 10 for how severe a uh, vulnerability is. Like Lock for Shell was 10 out of 10 because of how common it was, how easily exploitable it was, and um, the end result was a low code execution. There's another scoring system, um, EPSS, Exploit Prediction, which will give you more information on the likelihood that this vulnerability will be exploited, which can help again with vulnerability prioritization. So now we have an ID, we have a scoring system, we have to store them somewhere, and that's where vulnerability databases come in. One of the main ones is the um, NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, and that lists all the vulnerabilities um, of all the CVEs. So, but there's vulnerabilities outside of that, like, um, uh, like ecosystems will figure out there's a vulnerability before it gets uh, CV and then it won't be in the national vulnerability database. And usually these are in the security advisory databases and each ecosystem will have its own one. So maybe Rust will have one, uh, GitHub, NPM, they'll all have their own database. Uh, 
another thing that's important to vulnerability management is this new standard, um, BEX, Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange. So apparently, like over 90% of vulnerabilities are in your open source vulnerabilities are not exploitable. And you want to concentrate on that 10%. <laughs> or, I heard somewhere else only 3%. That was another report. So, not, so it's you want to know the, the heavy hitters. And this REC standard is a companion piece to the SBOM. So SBOM will list out all your components, and a VEX will tell you uh, if you're not exploitable. So it'll say, um, oh, I'm not exploitable, and although I have that component in my software, I'm not exploitable. And so these two together make, make it a, a more powerful and um, useful tool for security professionals to prioritize their vulnerabilities. So you might be vulnerable because you've patched your software, because you've configured it to close those ports, to not use something, I don't know. There's lots of reasons that you're not vulnerable. And this is a great way to uh, communicate that. But if this is only a few months old, I think. So there's, there's hardly any tuning around it. But dependency track is tuning. Dependency track is always like early in, um, in all, especially anything to do with vulnerability management. And um, I think Gripe has uh, is able to understand this standard as well, which is that, uh, it, which is a tooling for uh, analyzing that one. So how can S bombs help with vulnerability management? So um, let's talk about the tooling and the workflows around that. So you need tools to have your S bomb, and that will just list the components. What you want is um, a tool to work on an S bomb that can consume an S bomb and then output all the vulnerabilities on their, their severity score. So there's different tools to help with that. Dependency track, I keep enjoying it. Um, it's a great tool for vulnerability management. Gripe is um, a tool, open source tool from Dependency Track is open source as well. Gripe is an uh, open source tool from Anchor, which we tell you the vulnerabilities in an S bomb in the standardized form. Um, Six to are put here because it will it will actually allow you to host your vulnerability report in an attestation. You can attach that to the container image. So it's, it could be used as part of a workflow. Maybe you build your software, maybe you build your container image, and you can attach this vulnerability report to your uh, to your Docker image and say at the time it was built there was no severe vulnerabilities. I always say severe and above because I was like surely it should be like a higher standard than that. But um, yeah. So let's run through a few workflows to make um, S bombs actionable. Uh, this is a <laughs> terrible diagram. But okay, so you, you build your container image, you push it to your container registry, so like the CloudSmith or whatever container registry you use, um, and then you generate your your S bomb. You can attach it to your your image, and then you can, um, or you can instead of attaching it to your image, you can push it to dependency track, and dependency track will have um, all the different vulnerability databases that can track um, your, if you're vulnerable to any of the components. Any of the components listed in s will check if you're vulnerable to them. And then you can set policies as well to say, oh, if, I'm, if there's any vulnerability above high, then you can alert these people. Whereas like, they have webhooks or integrations with Slack and stuff like that. Or it'll alert people. So that would be one workflow where um, it'll continuously analyze the S bomb and then alert the relevant people. So another workflow, and I'm going to do a demo of this. A demo, even though it's a video, <laughs> it's all live. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to create my container image, push it to CloudSmith. Um, Create my S bomb using the SIFT open source tooling, uh, attach it to that image using SIFT store, then um, set up a continuous security workflow where like it will um, it will use Gripe to um, monitor that S bomb and see if there's any vulnerabilities above a certain level, and if it's above 
critical, it'll quarantine the image. I'm quarantining as a Plexus feature, but it could, instead of quarantining, I could do the alerting either way. Okay, so this is the image, this is the video, so, and I'll just talk through it. So this is Cloud Smith. Um, you can host uh, all these system patches in the same repo. Uh, there's nothing, there's nothing in the repo. <laughs> so we're gonna push the Docker image to our, our um, case that we've got. So great, we pushed it there. Um, let's see if it's posted on Facebook. There it is, syncing. Um, while it's syncing, I'm going to generate a uh, our public private key using cosine, which is 6 or 2. And I can use it to sign the S bomb. Cosign generate key pair. So I have to type it my password and I'm overriding the existing key. And now I'm going to sign that Docker image using cosign sign using my uh, private key and then pointing to that image. Now when I go log in, you should see the sign signature. And then she is there. So let's go back and the next thing we're going to do is to generate an S bomb. And we're going to generate it using SIFT, that open source tool. So SIFT, Docker image, and output it in an SPDX format. Oh, and just to mention, I did generate a public private key using Postline, but they have an experimental feature to actually generate it using an email then you don't need to worry about storing your public private key anymore, which is which is really annoying. <laughs> so um, and that's experimental at the moment, but it looks like that that'll that'll happen soon enough or it'll just be in the um, the normal features. So now I have generated my S bomb, it should be finished soon. So it's 496 packages in that image. Um, oh. There you go, it's finished. So, SIFT can also generate it cyclone DX or machine readable. So, this is the SPDX, and this is what it looks like. And the versioning information, all the packaging information. Um, if I just look for a few Debian packages that are in here, just to show you a few Debian packages that are versioning. And now, so we've generated our SBOM, we want to attach it to um, our image, but we just don't want to just attach it. We want to attach it as a signed attestation because adding the signature to it uh, brings a lot more trust to it. So cosine attach um, SPDX as a, and then we're attaching the S bomb as the parent. And I'm assigning it using my private key. And so now when I go back, you should see a new attestation. There she is there. Great stuff. So I can't remember what the next one is. I think I um, extracted. Oh yes, I can verify that it was signed using my private key. Comes down verify. I'm going to use the public key to verify that. And it should say, "Good job." Yeah, signatures were verified. So let's extract that S from from our image. And then when we extract it, we can um, check it for vulnerabilities. So extracting it is a bit like that. I don't like the, the code, like um, we have to use jQuery and stuff like that. It's a bit messy, but it's okay. So let's um, check it for vulnerabilities using Garp, which is the open source tool for Marker. 
So yes, vulnerability scans. Um, oh, one thousand vulnerability is a lot. And same here. I want to fail on critical. So uh, it has it has failed on critical, and um, because there's vulnerabilities above that severity threshold. So now that the severity is above that threshold, I want to quarantine that image, and that means that image can't be uh, deployed or downloaded. Which means you can put a stop to it. It's, it's there still could be out in the wild, but at least you're you're not making the problem worse. Um, so I'm going to use the text with CLI, which is a wrapper around our API. And here you might also introduce some alerting as well. So you might message the owners of the um, of the packages. So you can quarantine it through the UI. But um, I think like just to drive automation, we should be using more like APIs type stuff like the CLI. So I just quarantined it there and it can't be downloaded. So that kind of shows a, a, a workflow that um, you could use to, to generate your SDOP and then do something actionable. Maybe so I actually have a GitHub in my GitHub um, account. I have a, a GitHub action where like I set up a workflow every night or something to check for vulnerabilities. So if anybody wants to look at that, you're, you're welcome to. I um, forked it from a uh, guy Dan Learn from Anchor who now is working in ChainGuard. So and I just uh, put in the extra stuff on quarantine and um, using Kaiser. Thank you. Next slide. Yeah, and there's the that's where my GitHub workflow is, but you can you can see how it could be a useful tool that's like that's not dragging you down, it's just constantly checking and it's not um, it's not interfering with your um, with your workflow. So um, future work for S bombs is probably around better tooling <coughs> for di for different ecosystems. I like the workflow for container images, maybe that could be a bit faster. Uh, better tooling around merging S bombs generated at different stages, and best practices around hosting your S bomb, like especially for non uh, OCI container images. So, tooling, tooling, tooling is mostly where uh, the future work will be. But, like I said at the beginning, there is a lot of funding from that template mobilization plan that hopefully will. I put a lot of activity into that area. So, um, Esbon's asked the question now of like, what is in my software? And this will let you ask, like, am I vulnerable to the latest critical vulnerability? So, it, it's really a, a powerful tool for, for driving vulnerability management. It's not everything, but it's an important component to it. Um, so, I know the tooling isn't like all there, but there is. You can generate an S bomb, so um, you, sh you should try to generate an S bomb as part of your build pipeline, and um, and then ask your suppliers for S bombs as well. Uh, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. S bombs are relevant right now, not like you don't have to wait for the tooling to be like absolutely perfect or the workflows to be perfect. So that's it. Yeah, if there's any questions, um, that's all I 